just to be official there. Okay, so um, I wanted to, and again, thank you very much. I, I'm going to talk today for a few minutes about the National Wildlife Centre, um, what our mission is, what we've been up to in the past uh, few years, actually. We've been uh, in existence for, for several years now. But I also want to put it in context of a, um, a One Health approach. And this is something that is growing in interest and buzzwords out there. And I, I want to tell you a little bit about how the National Wildlife Centre and more broadly, how the activities of wildlife rehabilitators across the country um, support this, uh, the theme of uh, One Health approach. So let me scroll to the next one. So the National Wildlife Centre um, we were founded in 2014, so it's an organization that um, I, I founded seven years ago, and really it was because I was looking for a different model of, of how we can help Canada's wildlife. So I, I wasn't looking so much to build, you know, the biggest wildlife center in my local area. Rather, I'm a big believer in partnerships, collaborations, and when we get together, we can do things better together. And so, um, unfortunately, though, you know, vet schools don't really teach much about wildlife medicine, very, very little. Yeah. And most veterinarians uh, graduate and become dog and cat vets or maybe even equine or livestock vets. But really, we don't have such a thing as I'll graduate and be a wildlife vet. So you have to get a lot of extra training to do this. Yet at the same time, there's a real big interest in wildlife medicine um, from veterinarians, but also from wildlife rehabilitators. And to me, there's a, there's a gap because we have wildlife rehabilitators who do an amazing job helping wildlife. And we have vets who are interested in helping wildlife. So, hey, how do we, you know, why can't we maybe try and put this together a little bit and build some partnerships there? So that was really what we're looking at is to train more wildlife rehabilitators and wildlife, uh, create more wildlife veterinarians in Canada. So we have, again, very few today as far as wildlife vets. Um, in our vision, we'd like to see the National Wildlife Center as a center of excellence in terms of wildlife surgery, medicine, rehabilitation, conservation, education. And this One Health concept that we are guided by really talks about that intersection between animals, humans, and environment. And what we're seeing is that you know, everything we do with wildlife, I mean, they are part of the ecosystem. They are part of the environment. And yet humans also are part of the environment. Some of what we do impacts wildlife and some of what, you know, where wildlife exists or try to exist can impact humans. And again, certainly again, for that nature perspective as well, that we're all part of the ecosystem more and more so as we all want to get out there and enjoy nature. And so if we, we start thinking about if one animal is impacted um, or one endangered species, and I'll show some examples in a minute, then that can affect the whole ecosystem. I, I can get this. I should um, maybe just okay. share too what some of the pictures are uh, as we go through. So this was a, um, a bobcat hit by a car at Hope for Wildlife and um, back in December. And uh, I was able to get special permission to fly there. So we surgically, orthopedically repaired the, the leg of that bobcat. And that was my intern at the time, Dr. Agnes, who has finished her internship. So she now uh, is a wildlife veterinarian and has gone back to British Columbia. Um, and this is um, a, a moose calf, <laughs> so at, up at Aspen Valley. The National Wildlife Center, we are uh, working to build our permanent home. Uh, we have been in operation, as I've mentioned, for seven years, but we only have a temporary clinic right now and we're mostly mobile as well. So a lot of the rehabilitators specifically in Ontario bring cases to us, um, but we have just recently acquired 100 acres in Caledon uh, where we hope to start next year and build a new wildlife hospital and a training center where we can bring in rehabilitators from across the country, as well as wildlife veterinarians, again, to, to learn um, and to train. We also, in the planning, have a big education center for the public, and we'd like to um, host events with the public and um, educate on cohabitating with urban wildlife, for example, or, you know, how do I do this? Or I don't want raccoons in my attic or whatever, whatever it may be. We hear it all <laughs> with wildlife. You, people love them. They are, you know, ambivalent or they hate them, but it's, it's okay. We can work with all uh, different opinions and perspectives, but education for us is really important. Um, so this, the, this wildlife center, this is the only other slide I have on it, but we have, um, over 100 wildlife rehabilitators currently that we work with across Canada. And we also, a lot of the rehabilitators we work with in Ontario, we do more of their 
uh, advanced surgeries and we provide guidance and advice to veterinarians that they may have. Um, so we, we have five wildlife veterinarian interns trained, meaning that they can, they're now able to comfortably practice with wildlife. We have another four that we're training this year alone. So we're growing a lot and I'll speak more about that in a minute. Um, and it was the first wildlife hospital accredited in Canada. So we like to say that Ontario will be our mothership, if you will. That's where we're going to build our headquarters. Um, but we are connected across Canada in right now we're in uh, Manitoba, Alberta, Nova Scotia and Ontario. So our work is focused in four areas. The first one is the wildlife medicine and rehabilitation. That's sort of what you think about when you think about, you know, rehabilitators and vets helping wildlife. So we look after the National Wildlife Center. If an animal gets hit by a car, for example, they're going to go to a wildlife rehabilitator, hopefully. So the member of the public, we get thousands of calls every year from the member of the public saying, please help this animal. It's been hit by a car, it's injured, whatever it may be. Um, and then they go to a wildlife rehabilitator. In the future, we'll be able to serve the GTA even better once we have our headquarters more permanent location. Right now, a lot of our focus has been um, referral based. So. In other words, we're helping groups like um, Procyon Wildlife or uh, Bear Creek Wildlife or Bear With Us or Blue Water Raptor. They, they will send their cases that need surgery to us or some of the, the, the medical cases to us. And then we do releases. Um, we also treat animals, of course, from toxins. So why is this important from a One Health perspective? Well, you know, something that we're, we're seeing more and more of is um, you know, habitat fragmentation in terms of humans, we're building more subdivisions and, you know, there's more urban areas and animals are finding themselves not being able to get out of places uh, or they're getting into trouble where maybe not everyone appreciates wildlife. Uh, and so we provide that um, education role. But wildlife rehabilitators also are at the front line of detecting thing, um, illnesses or, or diseases. For example, there, we just had a, a bear cub a few months ago that was uh, came in. It was had it was shaking, it was tremoring, seizing. Interestingly, we were able to provide supportive care and get that animal healthy again. Um, sadly, though, it, it something weird was happening with its bone marrow, and it wouldn't produce any more cells. And it turns out that after it, it and it, it passed away, and it turns out that that animal had what's called bromethylene toxicity. It's an it's the new rat poison. And it's a neurotoxin and there's no cure. And what's happening is that other animals are eating it or get um, indirectly. So it's the non-target species that are getting into this bait and dying. And so, you know, it's fairly new. So a lot of us are just scrambling to say, okay, well, what does it look like? What are the presenting signs? How do we warn vet clinics that if your dog eats this, this is what it could look like. So again, that whole concept of, you know, and children for that matter too, um, uh, ingesting things. So just a few other pictures to share. We get calls for anything. So fishing, I mean, uh, hunting, et cetera. This was um, a fish hook. Hopefully everyone can appreciate there is a hook in this bird. Uh, and if I know you can't see the line, but if you trace these little bright white rectangles, um, that's part of the line going down to the hook. Now, not that this is an anatomy lesson, but the member of the public, they see fishing line hanging out of a, a, a this is a merganser. What do you think they wanna do? They want to pull, right? And um, unfortunately, the heart lives right there. So if they pull, their the heart's come with it. So when it comes to a wildlife rehabilitator or the member of the public calls us, we tell them, please don't pull, bring it to us or bring it to a rehabilitator. And in this case, we went in surgically and removed that, that hook and line from that bird. And he did very well, or she did very well and got released. So that's a typical case of what we would see on, on pretty much a daily basis. Uh, this, you know, turtles, for example, this is a species at risk. All turtles now, uh, federally, so all of our eight turtle species in Ontario are federally a species at risk. And so anything we can do to help that species uh, is co contributing to the conservation efforts. And honestly, it's really hard to kill a turtle. So if you see a squished turtle, please take it to a rehabilitation center because most likely um, that turtle's not dead. And even even if we have to euthanize her and she's gravid or she, she has eggs, we can take her eggs and incubate them. You know, it takes a snapping turtle 20 years to reach sexual maturity. So anything we can do to help the population is, uh, is a good thing. You know, and heck, how do you treat a moose? We had to, this, this moose broke her leg 
and we had to go up for bandage changes to this was at Aspen Valley and we had to go do her bandage changes and of course she she's a wild moose so uh, this is she's just a baby here she's only 165 kilograms in this picture she was only maybe about seven months old um, but now when I go up to see her I'm actually going up next week um, she doesn't like me because I'm the one with the needle <laughs> that makes her go go to sleep so um, when we had to bandage change her and then she gets up and she's fine but she's doing very well uh, this was a bear that was hit by a car. No, sorry. This was a bear that actually was shot. Uh, we get a lot of um, shot animals. And so again, we can help them because not all um, hunters necessarily kill the animals. I mean, they try to, but they don't always get killed. And so a lot of these animals we see again by members of the public. Um, this was the, the mum, in this case, mum was hit by a car and then baby, this is a baby cub, was hit by a car. And if you can appreciate on the right, this this is the fractured bone here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. And um, that was a, a fractured tibia that we repaired. And actually he, this little one is getting released uh, this week. So that's uh, again, kind of typical cases we see. So that's the first main area that we work on and that's our daily existence. We don't get paid by the government. We do this, I do this as a volunteer. We, we just want to help wildlife and we have an opportunity to give back, but it does cost money because animals don't have owners, the wildlife don't have owners. So our second area, um, which is threaded throughout as you've heard me talk about is education and conservation. And we're doing a lot of this right now. So um, whether it's educating wildlife rehabilitators uh, veterinarians, again, how, and it could be dog and cat vets that don't really have an interest in being a wildlife vet, but one of their clients will bring them an injured bunny or a baby, you know, baby squirrel or whatever it may be. And they don't know what to do necessarily. So uh, we're putting on seminars and, and courses and uh, working with vets across Canada. I daily, I get x-rays sent to me or emails, just, hey, what do you think? How should I approach this? So we're trying to build out our education program um, we're also wanting to do more in public education as well and outreach around wildlife issues, uh, whether it be, you know, beware of, you know, COVID, for example, COVID and your pets, um, or, you know, wildlife diseases, West Nile virus, for example, and, um, and, and in your area, and I'll talk about West Nile in particular in a minute. We also support scientists in other um, areas. So right now, for example, I teach all of the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry's um, chemical mobilization program. And so it, it, they have to recertify every three years in order to go out and immobilize moose, bear, deer, whatever they need to do, again, to relocate, usually that's the case. Um, so we, I teach that program now. So we're doing a lot of education and then, of course, the veterinarians who really do want to be wildlife veterinarians, uh, we have programs that have doubled this year uh, in, in terms of the, the networking that we're building. So this is a little bit about some of the, this was one of my first interns, Dr. Sarah, um, and she was very happy to be working with her red fox that needed surgery. Um, but we have lots of different um, programs. We have volunteers that we also train. Um, and I teach wildlife rehabilitation at the University of Guelph. I have two courses. And right now I can say those courses, there's so much interest from the youth in wildlife rehabilitation. Now, um, we normally cap our first year course at 150 students. And I let a few more in and now we're at 250. So, um, it, and that's just from the University of Guelph. So it's very, it's, it's growing in popularity. And that's a nice thing to see that students want to be connected more with the environment. And they want to understand how our actions impact the environment. Um, these are our four interns for this year. They just started last month, actually. Dr. Hazel just started last week. And again, we're trying to build more of a networked approach um, with that mothership being in Ontario, but we partner with different wildlife rehabilitation centers. Uh, and so Hope for Wildlife is in Nova Scotia. Um, so I just got back from there on Sunday for, for training Dr. Hazel. Uh, on the top right is Dr. Sarah. She's out at the Wildlife Haven of Manitoba. And I just got back two weeks ago from there. Um, bottom left is Dr. Nalissa. She's here with me in Ontario. And then um, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Emily is on the right. She's at the Alberta Institute for Wildlife Conservation. And we're growing. So I, I, and I know I owe people calls back um, who are interested in having one of our interns, so having an intern part of their program. Um, it's a win-win because these centers that you see, there are partner organizations, but it's a, it's a training program for vets to learn more about wildlife rehabilitation. 
and then they can go back and they can treat more. So it's sort of the trying to, if, if we were just focused only at one center in Ontario, we're just going to folk, get those animals. But really what we're trying to do is build capacity across Canada. And so um, we have had interest from other centers and we, we are absolutely open to adding more centers to uh, the partnership. Um, so that, that second pillar was conservation and education. So on the conservation front, I've already talked about turtles, but Ontario had a really cool opportunity. In December, we were asked to go up to the First Nations um, in uh, Moose Factory Island um, to relocate some polar bears. This is Mama on the, on the right and her yearlings. These are almost two-year-olds on the left. And this was a first for Ontario. Ontario has never relocated polar bears before. Manitoba, up in Churchill, they have, but we haven't. And so we, we have researchers who are experts from the ministry who um, have done darting uh, more to do biometrics and science stuff, but not to actually move them. They've always been shot and killed. And so we were asked to go up and help and we did. And, uh, and we safely relocated mom and her two yearlings and we spotted them the very next morning running on the ice heading north. So that was a good thing. How does this tie back to the One Health concept? It's climate change. These bears have nothing to eat because the ice is too thin. They eat seals, the polar bears eat seals and they have no ice because it's thin. It's, it's just water up there. And this was in December. So they come down further and further and eventually get into communities looking for food because they're desperate. And this is a really big problem that we have right now uh, with climate change. You look at our forest fires in the Northwest part of Ontario right now that are absolutely devastating. Um, if, even if I just focus on Ontario for a second, I know there's horrible forest fires out West as well. Um, just in Ontario, we're seeing uh, Northwestern Ontario forest fires, uh, but because of the high heat that we've been having, we have no food for the bears. So a lot of the bears, um, bears spend eight months of the year in what's called a negative energy balance, meaning they, they're losing weight for eight months of the year. And so this is the critical time, August, September, and October for them to basically, and early November and sort of late July, this is a critical time where they eat up to 20,000 calories a day to go, be able to go into hibernation. And two things, three things happened this year. The heat, um, we have the uh, forest fires in Ontario, the gypsy moss, which is the, what the LDD moth, I think they're now calling it, that devastated a lot of the crop. Um, oh, and then the, it, we had a, a late frost. I don't know if everyone remembers, but in April, we actually had a frost and it wiped out the blueberries, which is the main staple for bears. Bears are mostly vegetarian. Black bears are, I'm talking about. And so climate change is having a huge impact on the animals. Um, not just killing off species and endangered species, but affecting their food supply. And so what's going to happen, we, we, we already were ready for it. Bears are going to start wandering down into communities looking for food. The black bears are, they're, they're, they're not dangerous animals. They're actually, you know, scaredy cats. They, they really are, but they're hungry. And so how do we teach the public about what's normal bear behavior? And uh, Mike McIntosh from Bear With Us does an excellent presentation on normal bear behavior. And uh, he has successfully released 700 bears back into the wild. Uh, not one of them has ever had an impact on a human uh, because that's what you see in the movies. So anyway, um, digressing a little bit, but ju just to say that that one health concept, how do we protect the species? How do we look at climate change and its effect on wildlife? So I'm just going to keep going here. Um, the third pillar of, of what we do at the National Wildlife Center is called knowledge creation and research. And I want to be careful. We're not researching on wild animals, rather, we're, because people think we're experimenting on them. Of course not. But we are learning from them. And bromethylene exposure is the one example I mentioned in that bear cub. We're actually, uh, I'm working with the University of Guelph, the toxicologist and pathologist, and we're going to publish that in the Journal of Wildlife Disease. Um, I published this uh, paper on outbreaks of West Nile virus in captive waterfowl at a rehabilitation center uh, in Ontario. And why that's important is that West Nile virus can hurt us as humans, just like it can hurt animals and birds. And by knowing what's going on with our wildlife population, public health ended up coming out uh, to look at the water quality in some of the, uh, in that area. It turns out there was a high West Nile virus area. And finally, wildlife emergency prevention, preparedness and response. Um, and this really has to do with oil spills. And yes, I know we don't have penguins in Canada, but 
Uh, these little guys I worked on in South Africa when I was down there uh, volunteering, and they should have nice white bellies. And you can see that they're black. These are these are oiled birds, and they're intentionally oiled birds. We call them mystery spills um, from bilge dumping from the ships that go along the coast. But we have that in Canada. Now it's gotten a little bit better uh, to be truthful off the East Coast in particular, but it's still a, a problem. And it's not just petroleum oil that we're looking at. I mean, certainly out in Alberta, it's also an issue with the oil sands. We worry a lot about the rivers. If oil spills into a river, it's flowing fast. Whereas if it's into a pond or even a lake, maybe we can boom it off. And so I worked with Environment Canada on Canada's oil wildlife policy, because believe it or not, wildlife was not part of Environment Canada's oil uh, response, oil uh, response plan before. And so about, uh, I think it was in 2015, um, a group of us got together and uh, had conversations with Environment Canada. Now there is one, uh, there is a part of that policy that uh, wildlife actually do, are part of the environment. And so again, when we look at what we do, everything we do, um, whether it's, you know, working with all these various species, species at risk, endangered species, um, you know, COVID again is an example, Ebola, uh, SARS, all of these viruses that can be, uh, and zoonotic diseases that can be passed between humans and animals, we can give animals diseases as they can give it to us. And so we have to be really careful with, um, you know, how do we look at our world from one lens and we all play a part in protecting health, but health of our planet. And that means health of humans, health of animals, health of populations of animals and individual animals, and certainly health of our environment. And we think that what we do at the National Wildlife Center touches on all of that. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we looked at um, just a couple of other examples before I, I close, but some of the research that I've been doing is uh, one of, as part of my PhD thesis, one of my uh, topics was uh, that's being published is reasons why animals are brought to rehabilitation centers in Canada. And we looked at 22,000 medical records and 97% could be attributed, up to 97% could be attributed to human direct or indirect cause. So that means hit by a car, poisoning, shot, um, window strike, um, wind turbine, uh, fishing incidents, etc. And so that's a lot. So that means humans are having quite a large impact on our wildlife populations. And, and how do we as a society think about that or do something about it in our own way, whether it's you know advocating for um, non-toxic uh, fishing or, or hunting ammunition. So there are different, different things that we, I think we can do to look at this. So that was one of my topics. The second topic though was um, trumpeter swans. Everyone loves swans. They're majestic, beautiful animals. Well, they were, I don't know if everyone knows, but they were once extirpated in Ontario, meaning they did not exist in Ontario, zero, uh, because of hunting. And that was back in the early 1900s. And so the Ontario Trumpeter Swan Coalition, which we do uh, work with them quite closely, they uh, started to try and do more to protect these trumpeter swans. And they've done such a good job that swans are now not on that species at risk in Ontario. But we wanted to know, I'm still getting a lot of swans in on a fairly regular basis. And I have a, uh, in my lab, I have a, a lead machine and I run lead on them and they all have lead. And it's like, hmm, these are those sick ones coming to us. We only have about a thousand birds in here in Ontario. How many are actually sick? So we sampled about 10% of the population. So about hundred birds free living in the wild that apparently looked healthy um, when they were being tagged. So we worked with Environment Canada and uh, it turned out that 90% uh, of them, 90% of these birds, so 90 birds had lead in their blood. And one in five of those birds had high enough lead levels that are to be considered toxic or caused permanent damage. And so, again, this is an area that how do we get involved as a society, you know, we can, we can present this information, but if we want to protect our species and our populations, how do we do that effectively. And so that's, again, where we work on that one health concept. So we are looking to expand, um, again, with more volunteers, more training, we want to train more vet students, biology students, wildlife rehabilitators, we want to build our network up very strong, and we need partnership to do that. So we, we need well, honestly, we need funding because we can't go ahead and build our center until we have the funding to do that. So that's a little bit about, um, about the National Wildlife Center. These are all of our patients and one of our interns as well who just finished uh, Dr. Jessica at uh, Alberta. Um, yeah, some of our different patients from around, uh, around, the, around Canada. And if you'll indulge me, I have just, it's about 20 seconds 
It's a, it's just a day in the life from yesterday. This was my day yesterday. You'll have to excuse the hand just for a second. It doesn't last very long. You don't need to hear the, but you can see. Okay, so it's about to, hopefully no one's dizzy. One. Two, three, four, and five. <laughs> so that was our that was our day yesterday. So these um, these little that's just a paintball <laughs> paintball that we're we're telling them get out of here go because we don't want them to be associated with humans. We've been helping um, bear with us. That's one of the rehabilitators we work with, um, and I'm one of the um, authorized by the province. So we work closely with them uh, to help rehabilitate and release bears. I'm just going to stop sharing now. And um, and uh, so yesterday we that was up near Timmins, <laughs> and so we uh, we go all over. I think we're headed to the northwest part of Ontario next week because Mike McIntosh at Bear with us does a phenomenal job at rehabilitating bears, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, we're there to help him to help on the medical cases. But now we're we I, I say you know we get the fun part, all of that release. You know it was a 18 hour day yesterday. We're doing that almost every week right now. But that whole 18 hour day yesterday it took about 20 seconds <laughs> to see them go, but it was so worth it. And, and we'll keep doing that over and over again, but that's sort of a, a day in the life and every day is different. And I'm, I'm absolutely delighted and honored and privileged that I get to work with wildlife. And, uh, and I hope that, you know, me sharing the story a little bit will um, inspire others to support wildlife rehabilitators and in particular help the National Wildlife Center get our center of excellence built so that we can then train even more people in Canada. So that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Cox. So we're going to start off with questions, but I'm, I have three questions, so I'll start first. So in your bio in the Turk website. Uh, it says that you teach chemical immobilization to the provincial government. What is that? Sure. So um, that means if you want, so if the, there's a bear in a tree in Toronto and it's happened, right? Um, if the, if we want to get the bear out, the, the police will call the ministry of natural resources and the ministry will come and tranquilize that bear. Hopefully, that's how it's supposed to go. And so the ministry all over the province of Ontario will tranquilize animals, but they're using drugs and they're using very strong drugs to trank an animal. And so they have to take a training course for that in order to be authorized by Health Canada to be allowed to trank these animals and safely relocate them. And so that's, I teach that program. So I teach them um, all about how to tranquilize an animal, what the drugs are, how to use them, et cetera. Uh, thank you. So we, I know that medical procedure are expensive and these wildlife creatures, uh, they're probably, uh, their an anatomy is very different from each other. How much does a standard procedure cost? Like someone, like a bear got hit by a car. How much does it cost? Sure. That's a great question. And you're right. Anatomically, they're all different. Um, it, it, it varies, but uh, an orthopedic surgery like I showed in that cub could cost us around, my just cost maybe around $1,200. Yeah, and, and if it's a big, like an adult bear, then a plate or those pins, the cost is a lot higher. So it could be upwards of maybe $1,800 to $2,000. Um, in a bird, when we do, and we do a ton, like thousands of wing orthopedic repairs on like snowy owls, bald eagles, we get them all the time. Those cost us probably around maybe six hundred dollars for for the drugs, maybe a little bit more, maybe about eight hundred dollars because it's the ongoing care too. It's not just the surgery. Then we have to give the medication, and they're usually in rehab for about th two to three months. And why isn't the government funding this kind of rehabilitation? That is such a great question, and I don't know, <laughs> but it's it, that's consistent everywhere. To be honest, um, the government. I, I could only speculate, but they don't feel that it's their responsibility to pay for the care of wildlife. Um, you know, often we hear that the term let nature take its course. Well, when you look at the research that what's happening, it's not nature, it's humans, you know, having this impact on, on wildlife. So I would argue, I would love for the government to help support us, but I'm 
at this point, no. And, and that goes for most rehabilitators. I can't speak for every province, but certainly in Ontario, I know that's the case. Thanks, Dr. Cox. Does anyone have questions, Lynn? Um, yes, it sort of follows on from that. I just wondered, did you or your organization um, get asked your opinion or input when the government is doing environmental assessments for new projects and development? It seems that often it's a perfunctory thing. They go ahead and then it's people like you who end up having to mop up afterwards as the animals do get displaced or damaged. Yeah, great question. And um, no, usually we're not asked because I don't think they want to hear what we have to say, to be honest. A lot of the organizations don't necessarily want to hear. Um, or, you know, even some environmental organizations, again, they're looking at, you know, drainage systems and the effect on ponds or creeks or streams uh, or the, the impact of the, the, the fauna, the, the, the flora rather. And so people don't really think about the wildlife. Um, as much, or they might, you know, I, I the, for example, in my area, they want to widen the road. And so I personally had an issue with that. So I went to say, have you thought about then underground corridors for these animals to, to from a road ecology standpoint, so that we have so much roadkill on our road, it's a busy road. So how do we, how do we mitigate that? But I, I we haven't been asked nearly, uh, well, no, actually, we haven't been asked at all. Uh, again, it's just me trying to to get my way in and, and voice my opinion because it's what we see. So that's why it's important, I think, that the work we do, that research, I want to get this paper published so that people can see we have an impact. And then other organizations can take that work and say, hey, we need to do something about this as we are thinking about development. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be developing because you know we, it, that's going to happen, but how we do that, and we should be doing it thoughtfully. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully our research will help. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Guru, you need, uh, you're muted right now. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, there you go. Hi. Hi. I really enjoyed your lecture in the last few days. I've been watching advertisement on the TV and I said I've got to donate some money for wildlife. I have two questions. One, do you get any help from veterinarians that are in private practice? Um, so a little bit, I mean, not help financially speaking, but um, some of them want to help wildlife rehabilitators. And so to me, that's help. That's help if they can um, work with me and I can do some training with them and then they can help more animals. Again, it's that help the, you know, if, if we can train more people to help the animals and we're spread out farther and we can build a network. So that's where our help comes from but not financially. I haven't seen that. Now, your patients, how do you come to know that the birds or the other animals or bears are injured and need service, medical service? Yeah, how so do you spot? Yeah, usually it's actually a member of the public um, who call in and say, you know, there's, there's an eagle or there's a hawk and it's on the, on my driveway or it's in my backyard and it's drooping its wing. Okay. And we'll say, send us a picture or they'll see a turtle at the side of the road. It's the public, it's the citizen science that we're really seeing um, the public helping. Now the, they don't all come to us. They could go to other wildlife rehabilitators across the province or across Canada, depending on where they are. And those wildlife rehabilitators, um, we all know, I'm also an, an authorized wildlife rehabilitator in Ontario, and we know what to do when we talk to the member of the public when they call, we'll say, can you safely capture that animal? Um, and we'll give them some instructions. Maybe it's just put like a laundry basket over top of it until someone can get out. Or, um, you know, if it's really down, we'll say, get a big towel and here's, put it in a box. We'll, we'll give them some instructions. And then we help them with where to take it. What's the nearest wildlife center that can help them? There are very few wildlife centers, uh, unfortunately. And because mo none of us, you know, we all work at pretty, most of us work as volunteers. So it's hard to find a rehabilitator. And often we get calls from the public saying, I can't find anyone, uh, especially with raccoons. You know, there are very few people that will uh, rehabilitate raccoons, but it's usually the members of the public that find them and call us. And do you have paramedics, like for the humans? Yes, um, we call them uh, veterinary technicians. Yes, we and we do. They're volunteers with us, so we do have 
um, one vet tech, she drives from Kitchener to Caledon to help us as a volunteer. Yes. And you're doing fantastic work. Oh, thank it you. It's very heart wrenching to see that all the animals are being helped. Now, the dogs that are in abandoned dogs and cats, do they, do you look after some of those if they're in distress? Um, well, as a veterinarian, I will help any animal in distress, but our center, we're not licensed for domestic animals. We're only licensed for wildlife, which is opposite of 99% of the veterinary clinics out there. They're licensed for dogs and cats. Um, that said, I know, you know, a veterinarian is allowed to help any animal in distress, even if we're not licensed for it. So we can certainly take in an animal, stabilize it, and then transfer it to maybe it's a cat shelter. Um, you know, it, Ironically, my mother happens to run a rescue, a cat rescue. So if it was a cat, I would be sending it to her. <laughs> um, but I would help her, of course, with that. And she gets veterinary help too. But yes, it's it's a lot, it's a lot easier to find veterinary help for uh, um, dogs and cats in need than wildlife in need. And that's only because of a comfort level and training. That's all. John, thank you. you. Thank you, Guru. John, your turn. Uh, yeah, question. If one comes across, uh, if you're walking in the ravine, whatever, and you come across an injured animal, what we've been sort of instructed is to call the city. Uh, is it, what is our best method? Should we be trying to contact your organization directly or do we contact the city and, and hope they will contact you? Yes, well, I mean, the city of Toronto is a little bit different. There's a lot more, um, there are more resources and infrastructure than outside of, of downtown or of uh, the GTA. Um, there, you, it's up to you. There are options. You always want to make sure you're safe, of course. If you call um, us, we may instruct you to try. It depends on the situation. We'll talk to you about it. And okay, it's a baby bird. Absolutely, put it in a box and take it to a rehab center for sure. Um, but if it's a, you know, um, uh, an injured coyote and you don't feel comfortable going near it, then no, it's fair enough to call the city. Toronto Animal Services, um, I don't know the relationship um, with Toronto Animal Services and Toronto Wildlife, so I don't know if they transfer them to Toronto Wildlife or if they euthanize them. I can say outside of Toronto, most of the animal services will euthanize the animals. Um, so they're not rehabilitators. They, they are more, okay, we'll look after that and, and euthanize it, basically. So I would suggest that you know you, if you contact a wildlife rehabilitator, they can at least help you with that or assess the situation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Marion. Do you have um, uh, like a 1-800 number or a number that people should know about that we could call? Because I mean, I come across you know, turtles that are at the side of the road. Actually, it's funny, if you see them in the middle of the road, we try and scoot them across. They don't get hit by a car, but occasionally they don't make it across the road in time. Um, or, you know, if you see a injured animal in the ravine like is there a 1-800 number we can call yes um well there's it's not an 800 there is a 416 number on our website which is nationalwildlifecenter.ca and the center is spelled the canadian way re um and our number is on there now just reminding him we we're not open to the public yet because we don't have that center we're trying to build that center that's what we need and then absolutely you would would say call us bring it to us we'll have a rescue team go get it if it's within a reasonable uh, area that we can do it or we'll relay it i mean right now i have animals coming to me every week from all across the province from sault saint marie from sarnia from ottawa to like people are bringing them because they're desperate to get these animals help so we'll do that but they for now I'm fixing the animals, but they have to go back to the rehabilitator as of this moment. I just don't have the space yet. I don't have the center built, but you're welcome to call for advice. Um, so for example, using your turtle, if it's a squished turtle, and again, I would say, hmm, are you sure she's dead? And even if she is, maybe we can get her eggs. Um, uh, you can also call the Ontario um, Turtle Conservation. And we are one of the folks listed as a relay. So we, the turtle can come here. I stabilize it. I can fix its fractures. I can do everything, but then it can go live and can go rehabilitate at Ontario Turtle Conservation. So we're one of the, um, the, the hubs, if you will, they have many, and, and that's just to try and get the turtles across Ontario. We actually, in our new plans at the Wildlife Center in Caledon that we're hoping to build, 
we have um, pools for turtles where we'll keep them. So we will actually rehabilitate them ourselves. Right now we're just doing some of the fixing. So every veterinary surgeon knows how to do surgery or they have specialists for serious problems for surgery? So every veterinarian is trained to do surgery, yes. But most veterinarians, I would say 99%, will not touch a wild animal and, and, and maybe nor should they because the, um, I, I, I'm not sure who brought it up earlier, sorry, but the anatomy is so different. It really is, um, you know, a bird doesn't have lungs like we do and their bones are very different. And even the medications we give them are very different. So really mostly it's wildlife veterinarians that do the surgery on wildlife. Are there enough around to go around? No, oh. <laughs> it's not. You know, we so desperately need veteran, more. Pardon me? After, after the graduation to veterinary school, uh, to become a wildlife veterinarian, yeah. you have to have some special training? Yes, and that's what we're doing now. So I'm training. I have four veterinarians now that I showed the picture of the four in uh, like Ontario, Nova Scotia, Alberta, and um, Manitoba. Um, they are all veterinarians already, and they have experience. Um, one of them actually has 25 years experience she just retired from her practice in Toronto and she moved to Nova wow. Scotia and she really wants to learn to be a wildlife vet. So she's spending, they spend a full year with us training um, to be a wildlife veterinarian. So Nova Scotia, for example, she's now seeing seals and bald eagles where before she used to just see dogs and cats. So we, we train them. That's the specialty that they're getting because when I graduated a while ago, there was no such program. Uh, and so we're trying to, to train more vets because we need them even if they don't do it full time, just to be able to help out if they go back to their companion animal practice, at least they won't be you know, doing any harm or maybe they won't be as afraid to handle a red tail hawk now or you know, a, a rabbit, for, for example. That's very nice, very commendable. And I plan to donate something through my club to <laughs> your organization for sure. Thank you, Guru. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's really what we need is we need... We need even connections and networks and we're going to have a gala fundraiser in April to raise more awareness and it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg and if anyone has suggestions I'd love to hear it but you know we, we can't publicize too much about who we are and what we do because we're not open to the public yet but we desperately need a place to be open to the public because we're getting thousands of calls every year so it's it's this how do we how do we just get this done we just need to build the center so that we can accept even more and we can do more um, here in Ontario. So you're affiliated to the International Wild um, Fund? No, um, we're not. I, I do talks internationally, but we're not. The National Wildlife Center is strictly Canadian. Um, we do train. So some of our interns are from the United States, um, but they, they are under our tutelage. They're under our umbrella um, and the university. They're not um, the University of Guelph, that is. That's where they're housed. Um, but they were not affiliated with any international organization. And then no contribution coming from the international fund to you? No, none. It's all of our funding comes from, um, we have a fundraiser who's helping us and she, uh, of development, and she helps writing grants, like grant applications, but they're really hard and very few. <laughs> they're hard to get and very few of them. Um, but a lot of it, again, is, is really it's the members of the public or its networks. You know, we need someone to, we need sort of a champion too, to say, hey, this is what we believe in this cause. We should be able to help Canada's wildlife. We believe this is a unique model. No one is doing this. I, actually, in, in, in North America, even that I can find, where it's the hub here in Ontario and then the spokes, you know, the satellite hospitals across the country partnering with rehabilitators. Because I, I did the numbers and it, and if we work by ourselves, we can maybe see 5,000 animals a year, but through these partnerships, we're going to be seeing at least, I think it was around 16,000 animals next year because we're helping others and we're partnering with others. So, you know, we, if we can find people and, and, and relationships and networks of people who say, I know someone who might be interested in this model or this, or this way of doing things, I, I really think we can, we can get the center built and do everything that we need to, to do and set out to do. I wish you luck. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. It's 1.40, so we have to end the meeting. If
Dr. Koss, can people email you or call you, not call you, maybe email you with questions if they have any more questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, my email, okay. I don't know if it was distributed, but feel free to distribute it or you can contact me through the, the website, nationalwildlifecenter.ca as well. Will do so. Um, Marion, would you like to thank the speaker? Yes, um, Dr. Cox, thank you so much for joining us today and spending the time to inform us about the work that you, that uh, the National Wildlife Center does. It's, uh, you know, basically you're helping those who can't help themselves and contributing the, to the beauty and the wildlife of, uh, of our great country. So thank you for your hard work and all of your efforts and we wish you luck and uh, thank you again for joining us today. Thank you very thank much, you. everyone. Thanks for the invite. Okay. Have a great day. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye, thank everybody. You. And thank you to all the, all the guests who joined us today.